So if you haven't guessed by that dramatic intro, this video is about this Hitachi TRK9150 boombox. However, calling this a boombox isn't really appropriate. This definitely fits in the category of ghetto blaster. Not only is it really big in terms of sheer volume, but this thing weighs a whopping 21 pounds, at least according to my IKEA bathroom scale. If you were to add the 10 D-cell batteries that this thing requires to make it portable, that brings the weight up to 24 pounds. That's a lot to carry on your shoulder, or perhaps hoist over your head to try to win back your girlfriend. I've been picking up cassette players over the past few years when I come across them, mostly to go with my vintage computer collection, but this certainly is the biggest and heaviest player I've ever owned. I found this in an online auction that was just about to end. Perhaps there weren't too many people watching at the time, but I ended up paying $37 plus shipping and handling. This was a bit of a risk on my part since I really didn't know anything about this particular cassette player, but it certainly looked cool, and vintage ghetto blasters can sell for quite a bit on eBay, so I figured I could always sell it if I didn't like it. I don't know if this one is particularly rare, but I couldn't find out much about it online. There were a few mentions in forums, but I couldn't find any service manuals or catalog advertisements, except for this one where someone had posted some scans about the European model and mentioned that they thought it was from 1979. However, the styling on this unit seems to me to be more from the early to mid 80s. Perhaps I can find some date codes inside the unit that will give me some clues if it needs any repair. Let me know what year you think this was made in the comments below. But for now, let's take a closer look at the Hitachi TRK9150. So let's start by looking at the controls on the top. The first thing um, that I was excited to see and I didn't expect to see is this antenna, which is still intact. A lot of times these break off because they are fairly uh, fragile but um, you can see it does need to be tightened because it, it doesn't have any uh, uh, ability to stand up on its own. If we start at the top here, there's a band selector between, uh, looks like uh, FM, shortwave, and MW. So you can switch between the different bands there. There's also two sliders here for the record volume. Um, which seem to work, but may need a little bit of deoxid. Then there's a number of toggle switches up here at the top. There's the record mode from uh, auto to manual. There's the riff, um, A, B, or C. Not sure what that is, I'll have to look that up. You can also switch between normal and chrome oxide tape. Then there's, interestingly enough, you can see down here, record riff tape, and then there's this huge setting here for AFC, mute wireless mixing. So you can either mute on or off. It just kind of looks funny the way that that's laid out there with that big one in the middle. And then there's the uh, stereo or mono switch. Over here you can switch between the different functions. So tape, radio, it's got a line in and a phono in. So you can actually hook up a turntable or something that uh, would output that same type of signal as a record player would. Um, and then if we look down here, interestingly enough, it has a light, so we'll have to switch, test that out and see if that's working, but I guess there's a light to light up the indicators on the front, perhaps. There's a balance, left-right balance, bass and treble knobs, volume knob, of course. Let's hope this thing goes all the way up to 11. And then there's a loudness on-off, so that's not definitely something I want to test out. And of course, the main power switch. Um, also on top, I don't know if you can see this, there are, it looks like two microphones, maybe a left and right microphone. So that's pretty exciting because that means that you could set this up in a, a place that had, had decent acoustics and you could actually record um, some music or, or what have you. All right, so taking a look at the front now, we have the uh, receiver dial here um, and as well as a FM stereo indicator to let you know if you're on uh, if you have stereo, a stereo signal or not. We have shortwave and medium wave, which I guess is AM here in the US. And then down here uh, by the digital quartz uh, symbol here, we have two VU meters. Um, they both say level, but then this one says battery, if I look really close there, and this one says tuning. And 
There's some scuffs on here. I don't know if that's stuff that'll come off or not. Uh, we'll have to see. I might try to get that off and give you a better view there. Over here, there's a clock, it looks like. And that's also, um, that's not the counter because there's a counter underneath here. So there's a clock here, maybe with an alarm or something. There's time set. Oh, there's a sleep mode, I see. Just below that, we have the tape mechanism with a mix mic volume, which is kind of neat. I guess that would be for if you had a microphone um, connected. There is a, a quarter inch jack down here for a mix mic and also some headphones. So, so that's pretty neat to have that separate volume there for the mix mic. You can turn that up and down. Um, we have a couple of LEDs here for tape or run. There's a record mute button, which again, which is just a momentary toggle. So that's pretty interesting. You have the uh, tape mechanism itself. You have a standby timer. Um, I'll have to figure out what that does. And then you just have the, the buttons here. I mean, there's also these, I guess they're protective. Um, they're, it feels like just plastic. I don't think that's metal, but there's these plastic standouts here, which you know, you're not gonna use to lift the, the thing up but I believe what these are for, and perhaps this metal bar down here, are to protect the uh, chassis and the buttons, because I'm not really sure what else you would do with that. But maybe if you were gonna put this in the car so that the buttons and the knobs didn't get mashed up next to something else, maybe that's why they included it. But it certainly gives it a distinctive look. Okay, let's take a look at the back. This has a really hefty handle, and it needs to, because this thing weighs a ton. Um, it's hard to lift with one hand because it's so heavy. Uh, but let's just take a look at the back and see what some of these inputs are. So here you have the uh, the model number here, TRK9150W. And then uh, there's also inputs for antennas uh, back here, as well as the uh, phono input, the line input, and the line output, as well as an additional mic input that you can connect to this thing. There's also a voltage selector, so you could run this off of uh, 250 or 240 volts if you were in Europe. And then there's two inputs back here, actually. One is just for AC input, but then there's also a DC input, which is uh, 12 to 15 volts. And that's because we also have battery case back here. So you could load this thing up with batteries and run it off of batteries. Who knows how long those things would last though, because these are fairly high wattage speakers. This foam here, I don't know if you can see it, is, uh, is actually just gone. I'm gonna have to take that off pretty quickly because it, just touching it, it disintegrates. So these speakers are also detachable. There's a little latch release here. When you click that down, you can push the speaker back and it will release. And as you can see, it's on. it has these little uh, uh, keyhole connections that connect to these round posts here. And that's how it uh, it connects. But also, I believe, I'm not sure, I'll we'll have to check this out. I believe these also connect the audio from the main cabinet or from the main part of the system to the speakers. So you don't have to have a cord connected all the time. But it is, it, it's pretty nice to just be able to hook these up and have it work and have the audio connected automatically for you. And then, as I said, there's this part on the bottom here where you can lift up and there should be, yep, there's a little cord here. Uh-oh. It looks like someone has hacked this cord together with another cord, maybe to make it longer or something. Um, but I believe there is, yeah, down here, there is a little place where you could connect the speaker in and then spread these speakers out to give yourself more room if you were to set this up, up up on a shelf or something like that. But yeah, we'll definitely want to fix this. It's got a lot of bare, bare twisted wires in there. So we'll fix this up and, and get rid of that stuff. For now, let's go ahead and plug this in and we can give it a test run, see what's working and what's not. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so that's a good sign. Seems like the radio is working. The city of San Jose is several weeks behind on paying homeless people participating in the new cash for trash. Program. Yeah, it seems to be working. Let's turn the volume down a little bit. Ooh. Yeah, we definitely have to fix that. So the, the potentiometer on the volume knob is definitely needs to be cleaned. 
probably a lot of the other knobs do as well. And these uh, switches on top will probably also have to be cleaned. But for right now, that seems to be working pretty well. So at least the radio does work. Now let's try to switch this to tape. And it did switch to tape. So let's see if we can put a tape in here. I can hear the motor running, but the tape itself is not spinning. So that's a good indication that we'll need to replace a belt. So that's another thing to add to the fix it list. Let's see if rewind and fast forward are working. No, and they won't stay down either when I press them. So there's definitely at least a belt that needs to be replaced. But so far, so good. At least it does work. One more thing I noticed is that this uh, LED here, this little display, is not working either. So that could be a bad display. It could be bad connections. But there's nothing here when I, um, when I press this. There's nothing that happens. And I'm not sure if the light actually does anything either. Maybe you can see on camera. There's a little light, but I'm not seeing anything come on when I hit light. So yeah, we'll have to take a look at that display and see if we can figure that out. So let's see if we can figure out how to open this up uh, before the sun comes in on the ping pong table here and I lose the ability to uh, record. I'll take this tape out. Oh, unplug it. One nice touch I just noticed is this uh, screw here which doesn't necessarily need to come out for the uh, to remove the back, at least I don't think so. But it does have a little uh, description here, which is the you remove this screw in order to change the antenna. So they uh, anticipated that this antenna would break, and in order to replace it, you can just remove this screw and swap out the antenna. So that's a really nice feature. And there we go. I think if I detach the antenna here, I can open this up. Okay. There we go. So, so far it does open up quite nicely. It appears that this is the power supply here, I'm assuming. Um, and it's got some nice big, or a nice big cap down here. Um, it's a little dusty, but the power supply looks in good condition and we know it's working. So this all looks good. There's more um, uh, spade connectors here, so I can actually disconnect this really easily. And the wires are all nicely color-coded, so that'll be easy to put these back together when I'm done. And then I'll have to see how this center part comes out. And it's a little hard to see, but if I shine my the flashlight from my phone in here, you can see where the audio connects. There's one here and there's one further back in here. And those are just tied together with the audio jacks here on the side. It's the exactly, exactly the same connection. And there's two here on the bottom and two here on the bottom on the other side. So if something were to go wrong there, although it seems to be working now, if you had to clean those connections, for example, to make a good, a good uh, uh, electrical connection, you could certainly do that. And you would know that the top two are just dummy connections for support, and the bottom two are actually where the audio comes in. And interestingly enough, as I'm starting to slide this out, I'm noticing that this just comes, the whole panel comes right out as I slide it out. So not very hard to take this thing apart, actually. There's a lot of pieces and components you have to keep track of, but it could be a lot worse. And here it comes. The rest of the mechanism seems like it just slides out. Okay, and that is it. The back is now disconnected. can set that aside. And we can take a closer look at the, the mechanism, which is really built exactly to fit inside that middle set of uh, uh, the, the middle plastic there, which is amazing that they packed all this in to this rectangle form factor. So you get a look there at some of the, uh, some of the controls. This might be for tuning. I'm not a radio expert, so I'm not sure exactly what all this does. And luckily that all works, so I don't have to figure it out. And there's the inside of the, the mechanism itself. Let's take a close look at the tape mechanism. So here's the tape mechanism. It does need to be cleaned. And again, I'm not a massive uh, audio geek, audiophile, but it looks like a really nice mechanism. It's definitely not the cheap one. 
that you see on all the things these days. So I'm hoping that this will give us a really nice quality sound output. I'll have to clean the head. The record head looks like it's a separate uh, driven magnet type, perhaps. And uh, everything else looks really good. It just needs a little bit of TLC and cleaning. So I'm guessing I'll be going through a lot of Q-tips uh, just to clean this part up, but otherwise it looks okay. Now the question is, how do I get to the belt? Because the two things I really need to change, one is the belt, I'm hoping, which is behind this. I don't think this is direct drive. And the other is um, the potentiometers on the top. We all need to have a little bit of uh, deox that applied to them to get those working. And so the question is, how do I get in to change the belts? I found a motor here. I can take the LCD off here. And there is a chunky motor. Um, but I'm sure if it's belt driven, the belt is going to be behind the mechanism. And it looks like you can disassemble the mechanism if you really wanted to, but I want to avoid that if possible because I don't want to mess anything up. So I'm looking for another way to get in to change the belt. Um, on this side, they have a really nice cable management set up. The other option is on the back here. Um, there are some screws holding this main board on, but you can see all the wires come in and are terminated. So if I have to take this backboard off, that's going to be a problem because all of these wires are connected. So I'm hoping that the key is this little side panel here. Maybe that'll give me enough space to get in there and change the motor. <laughs> nope. It does let me service the pulleys that go to the tuner, but that's not going to give me access to those belts. Okay, so I finally got far enough to take that backboard off enough to see inside. Um, and you can see it looks a bit of a mess, but it's really not too bad. I think I can get it back together. But it was a lot of work to get that far. Um, and unfortunately, when I did that, I noticed on the inside, um, there's actually, it looks like it would have been easier to take the mechanism off the front didn't look like that initially, but now it does actually look like <clears throat> I can get to those belts easier from the front. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this, see if I can get the mechanism off easily. If I can, I'll put the back together and then we can take a look at those belts. Okay, so now I've got the back open and there's this little plate here, which I can remove. And now you can see the mess of belts here. So there's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. This is a thick one. That's the one I think I may have to order, unfortunately. You can see that one is, uh, yeah, it might go back on actually. Let's just see if it slipped off. It's possible that I could get, could get this going with the existing belt. Oop. <laughs> nope. Not with that belt anyway. So I'll take these belts off and see if I have some replacements. Now, to address the crackling on the volume and the other knobs, I removed this little panel, uh, which gave me access to the potentiometers, and sprayed some deoxit in each of the potentiometers and moved them back and forth quite a number of times just to lubricate and free up any corrosion or deposit that was on those potentiometers. That should help with that crackling sound. I also got lucky and found this broken wire on the erase head, so that'll be a quick fix for the soldering iron. And speaking of the soldering iron, I need to do something about this awful patch job that somebody did to this cable. So I'm just gonna cut out the little extension piece they put in, and then I'll use solder to join the ends back together. Uh, official soldering guides will tell you to twist the wire together and then solder, but to be honest, the solder is stronger than uh, the actual wire. The, the wire will break before the solder does. So I just solder them together. And then I put some heat shrink over one of the wires to keep them from touching and shorting out. And then a bigger piece over both wires will fix it up. Good as new. One of the belts I used was a little narrower than the original belt, so I wanted to do a test to see if everything was working when this happened. <laughs> It appears that something's wrong with the take-up reel. It doesn't seem to be actually taking up the tape. The capstan is working fine, so it's pulling the tape through across the head, 
but the take up reel isn't reeling up the excess tape after it gets through that stage. So on taking this back apart, I found that one of the pulleys that makes the uh, take up mechanism work uh, was loose and wobbly. I think the post had one of the posts had broken off and it definitely should not be wobbling like this. So I used a little super glue and tried to put it back in place without getting any on any of the rest of the mechanism. And testing it out, it seems to work okay. I think it's gonna hold. And the last thing I do before I put everything back in the case and test it out is clean it up. I mean, there is gunk everywhere. There's dust, gunk. I mean, just caked on stuff in here. It didn't look too bad from the outside, but now that I've got it open, there's just little dust bunnies everywhere. So I'm gonna make sure I clean all that out. And to do that, I've got an industrial size uh, carton of Q-tips and some IPA alcohol and some Windex. I'm just gonna to go to town on this thing and see if I can clean all of this stuff up before I put it back together. Cause if I get it back together and everything works, I don't wanna to have to take it all apart again to, uh, to, to do another cleanup job. Okay. Time for the cleanup job. That I'm gonna go over every nook and cranny with a Q-tip. So step one in the cleaning process was just to clean up all the surface areas with Windex. Everything had a good uh, coating of dust on it. That got most of it off. And then it was down to the nooks and crannies. And for this, I had to use a lot of Q-tips and get into all of the crevices because uh, the dust was really um, in all of those uh, little tiny places. Uh, then I made sure to clean the heads, both the record head and the erase head, as well as the cap stand and roller, just to make sure I got all of the 20, 30 years worth of crud off there, and then cleaned all of that felt up that was protecting the dials and knobs. Then I took off the uh, cover of the cassette player. It was the only way to get behind there, but as you can see, cleaning that up really uh, did a good job. It got a lot of dirt off there and it looks great now. I also noticed there was some corrosion on the battery terminals and I was able to get this off just with some white vinegar and a toothbrush, put a little on there, let it set a little bit and then come back and work at it until that corrosion is gone. You definitely don't want to leave that on there. And finally, I could get rid of this old foam. It really just disintegrated um, as I took it off and uh, used a little bit of Goo Gone to get rid of the last little bits there and ended up having to scrape it off with a, with a spludger. It was really stuck on there, but I eventually did get it off. So before I close this up to do some more testing, I had an idea. Um, it would be nice, uh, since this thing is such high power, it would be nice to be able to hook it up and use it as a Bluetooth receiver, essentially, as well as a cassette player and a radio tuner. Now, of course, that didn't exist back when this was made. However, you can buy these cheap uh, Bluetooth receiver amplifiers from China, I think they cost maybe $5. I'd have to look up and see how much I paid for this. But this is small and it has, it takes a input and it also takes a, uh, of course it plays Bluetooth and it has some functions on it like volume, etc. So one thing I was thinking about is if I take this foam back off for the battery, since I really don't need it, I could probably just put that right there. And then the only thing I have to do is tap into the uh, line in and then when I turn this to line in um, it will and connect through Bluetooth it should play whatever's coming in through Bluetooth over my phone or, or whatever so I think that's what I'm gonna do take the foam off put this on the back of this board I just have to find a good voltage source now this does have a 12 volt DC input so I know at least there's 12 volts somewhere on the board so I'm gonna do a little looking and probing around on the power side and inside the chassis, see if I can tap into five volts, run that through the back of the battery compartment, and then I'll be able to hook this up. The other nice thing with having this on the back of the battery compartment is I can open it up, and if for any reason the, the perhaps the volume on the board is too low or something's going on, or I need to pair it with a new device, I can just open the battery compartment up, put it in pairing mode or adjust the volume as needed, and then put this back on, and it'll be hidden away and no one will see it. So that's what I'm gonna do now. Okay, so I snooped around the system a little bit and I didn't find anything on the board that was five volts. So this input voltage here, it comes out to about 20 volts DC. Uh, there's 20 volts split on two lines here. And uh, 
So with that, I need to regulate the power down to 5 volts so that I can drive this little board. And I think I found a good solution for that. I've got a number of these little tiny switching regulators. This is a drop-in replacement for a linear regulator, but it takes a lot less amperage. Um, but it's good up to 28 volts. It'll take in up from 5 to 28 volts and output a clean 5 volts. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap into this 20 volts that's coming in through um, this uh, uh, converter here, or the uh, transformer, and through this little board. And the nice thing is it's so small that I can just put that, pop that right on this board where there's some space. I'll just glue that down and then tap into the voltage uh, here. And then that'll give me a 5 volts that I can then pass through one of these holes in the where the batteries go to the Bluetooth board. So that way I can just stick this Bluetooth board on the back of that panel and I'll be good to go. So I think that's going to work out really nicely. So here is the Hitachi TRK9150 all put back together. Um, the only trouble I had getting it back together was there was a lot of wires to deal with, a lot of wire management. So that's why things were tied up so tight because it all had to fit inside here. But it is back together, everything's been cleaned, and we're ready to test a few of the features. One thing that I found, if you notice when I was cleaning those battery terminals, they weren't D-cell battery terminals, they were actually AA battery terminals. And I think that's perhaps to run the LCD, perhaps that's why that wasn't working. So I'm gonna just throw some AA batteries in there and see if I can get the clock to work. Now you'll also notice that um, I haven't actually attached this uh, Bluetooth adapter to the battery compartment cover yet. I will do that, but um, in some initial tests that I did, I found that the there was a lot of ground loop noise um, uh, using this particular module. And so what that means is, uh, because it was connected to the same ground as the rest of the system, it was introducing a lot of noise through the amplifier on that board. And uh, it was affecting basically everything that... Uh, uh, it wasn't just affecting when I was online in, it was affecting tape, it was affecting radio. And so I've ordered an isolated ground board. They're fairly small and inexpensive. And, and I'll be adding that later um, uh, to complete this mod. However, I will be testing this using a battery, an external battery, just to eliminate that ground loop noise. So when we get to that part, just know that I'm not, I don't have this quite finished yet. However, we can put these batteries in. just like that the LCD is working fine with those new batteries so it looks like we can set the time maybe maybe I have to hold this down and hit yep all right so now the time is set um, it looks like I can also set the sleep timer um, which will go off in 59 minutes it looks like um, and then I can also set that turn that off and then I can also Turn it on to set timer and you see it's set to wake up so let's set this for a few minutes from now and see if it actually works and one thing you'll notice on the top here is it says when the power is off the timer is auto so i'm hoping that will uh, even though the power is off that it'll actually turn on when the timer goes off yep and there it goes so everything, that, that actually works. So the radio came on, it was set to radio. I'm assuming it would come on with tape as well. But I'm gonna go ahead and turn this off uh, so I don't get any uh, copyright strikes on that particular radio station. So that works, that's pretty cool. Those battery did the trick and the timer's now working. So that's one more thing fixed. Also the scratchiness on the volume knobs, I'm not gonna demonstrate it here because um, I'll have to wait till I get some copyright safe music in here, but the scratchiness on the knobs has all been taken care of. There was a little bit when I first started, I just needed to work these knobs a little bit to get that scratchiness out. So that's all working as well. So one thing I found out by accident was the meaning of this AFC mute wireless mixing button, which is currently set to off. Uh, while I was playing around with the radio, um, I had it in tape mode and I had this on. And what I realized when this was on was it was actually letting the FM radio in. And so my guess is that this button was for kind of a karaoke, maybe, maybe that type of functionality where you could turn the radio on and sing along with it or record uh, on a tape while you were singing. Um, so you get that radio background in. So if I turn this on, so it just so happens that with the antenna down, it didn't pick up the, uh, the radio quite well enough. But if I, there you go, you can kind of see it when I touch the 
Touch the antenna. Yeah, I can't leave that on for too long, but basically um, with that button on, even though it's in tape mode, line in, it doesn't really matter. It, uh, if, if this AFC mute wireless mixing is turned on, that will allow the radio to come through. And I just happened to discover that by accident, by accidentally touching the, the antenna while it was down, while I was in one of the other modes. And then I just messed around with it until I figured out if I turn that off, I don't get that anymore. So that's what that button does. So that was kind of an interesting discovery. So let's go ahead and just test some of the functionality from an audio quality standpoint. So let's start with the radio. Um, again, I don't want to hit any copyright strikes, so I'm just going to uh, put the antenna up here all the way. Turn it to radio and we'll see. Internet at KPFA.org. You can see the signal is quite loud. The, next three hours. the, um, so let's in. We got some great the uh, stereo light does work. If I go off signal, it'll go away. Go back, it comes along. Uh, you may not be able to see this, but the tuner strength is also uh, working quite well to kind of dial in that, that tune, um, uh, specifically get it right on so you get the clearest signal. Let me just go to... Uh, medium wave, that should work as well. There we go. So there's uh, uh, AM or medium wave, depending on what you want to call it, but that is actually working as well. So there's no problem there. So let's do a quick test of the uh, cassette the audio coming from the, uh, uh, the tape function. Now I did have these, uh, I just happened to pick up these new Type 1 TDK 90 minute tapes um, the other day. And so I had these laying around. They are Type 1. I don't have any metal tapes that I can uh, test on here. I'm sure that would sound much better. Also, keep in mind that I'm recording this from a shotgun mic, um, and I made this other tape with my Pioneer deck that I haven't used in 10 years. So the quality is not going to be great on this. Uh, I, I am not Tecmon. I don't have any fancy tape equipment that I, can, uh, that I know I'm going to get a high-quality recording out of. So just keep that in mind when you're listening to this. It's just really for demonstration purposes. Um, but let's go ahead and put in a tape and listen to some music through the tape deck. You can see the uh, the quality is pretty good, I think, um, and it does light up when the tape is on. It lights up these little indicators, which is kind of neat. I think that's a gimmick, though. I haven't been able to. It says tape run. I haven't really been able to get that uh, to really do anything um, other than just blink back and forth like that. Perhaps it has some function. I'm not sure. Let's go ahead and try out a different song real quick. Now I have the uh, the loudness on right now, which I happen to prefer. It adds just a little bit of a bass, a little bit more bass uh, to the low levels, but you can see what happens if I turn it off. There's not a whole lot of difference. Let me turn it back up. So that's with the loudness off and on. Off and on just adds just a little bit um, to the bass. And I have everything else set to normal. The balance is in the middle, bass treble, it's all in the middle. So of course you could turn up the bass manually if you wanted to. That's full bass. And back to normal. 
So that's the cassette. I still haven't adjusted the timing or anything. There's still some other things that I need to go back and repair as well. So there's uh, the fast forward and rewind I found aren't working right now. Um, I'm gonna uh, take a look at adjusting those and getting those working when I go back in and, and put in the permanent belt replacement when I get that done and adjust the timing as well because I think this is perhaps running just a little bit slow. But it is working um, and it sounds pretty good. And the last thing I wanted to do was just test out the Bluetooth module that we added to this. So if I change this to line in um, and connect my phone, just give me one second. Bluetooth I will say that there's some interference because it is Bluetooth and, it, and it, uh, in the wireless connection, every once in a while, you'll pick up some interference from Wi-Fi signals or other signals. Um, but essentially, uh, I've got the phone connected via Bluetooth, so if I just hit play on my phone, we'll hear that same song we were listening to before, but coming this time over the line input coming out of the Bluetooth module. One thing I noticed is the uh, the um, the meters here actually do respond to the uh, Bluetooth module, but not nearly as much as they do on when I'm running the tape mode. So there's a little issue there. I'm not too worried about it, but um, I just noticed that they're really quiet when uh, I'm running in line in. But the sound is the sound quality is actually really nice. So I should be able to. Uh, take this somewhere, plug it in, and uh, connect over Bluetooth and have it, you know, uh, you know, basically fill a room with sound if I want to. It's essentially the ultimate Bluetooth speaker at this point, portable uh, Bluetooth speaker. I'm not sure if I'll be able to fit the batteries in the back of the compartment with the module in there. We'll see. I might be able to because it's so thin. Um, but uh, anyway, I don't want to invest in 10 D cell batteries and uh, uh, have it, you know, only run for half an hour probably or something. Um, so yeah, it seems to be working pretty well with Bluetooth and it does get quite loud. So let me just do a quick loudness test. So when this kicks in, I will uh, turn it up to about 50% and we'll see how loud that gets. Yeah, so that's only, uh, my son says it sounds like it's working. I think I woke him up. So that is actually only 50% volume. So you can imagine if you turned it up uh, higher than that. You could definitely fill up uh, a very large room, perhaps even an auditorium style uh, size room um, with this particular unit because it's just that loud. So definitely fits in the category of ghetto blaster for sure. Well, that's going to do it for this uh, repair and uh, review, I guess, of this Hitachi TRK9150. This thing is really heavy and especially awkward when I'm trying to sit in a chair. Let me put this down. Ugh. I guess that is one of the best ways to carry it though because it is so heavy. You just put it up on your shoulder and listen to your music all day long. Um, I'm really glad that with the way this came out, even though there are a few more things I need to repair the reverse and fast forward features, get that new belt in place and a few other things. But uh, all in all, I would say this is a, success, is a success, and I really can see using this. I was thinking perhaps at the next Maker Fair, I could put this in a room and play some music and everybody would be able to hear it. Plus, it would be a nice conversation piece, piece for people to talk about and, and look at. So really glad with the way this came out. 
That's going to wrap it up for this episode. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button if you're interested in radio repair like this or just appreciated uh, the video today. Also hit the subscribe button so you will see my videos. They'll come up in your feed. Uh, you can join my Patreon or if you're on social media and uh, perhaps you're not quite ready to donate a few bucks on Patreon, you can actually follow me on Instagram and Twitter uh, for free. And you can see I do post pictures in between my episodes of things that I'm working on or things that I find funny or whatever. So follow me on Instagram and uh, Twitter as well. So that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Until next time, thanks for watching.